Jim T. Chong, the walk star, and we have a really powerful show for you today. And I'm with Jim Meyer from Remax Gold. And we are with Patricia Simmons, attorney at law in, in Solano County. Wow, there's some good stuff that's happening here. So, yeah. you know, in today's show, it's going to be very, very special. And uh, Jim, let me ask you this. You know, and what's going on right now, I mean, who doesn't need a good attorney, right? <laughs> and we're going to be learning Absolutely. a lot of good things as well. But Jim, I got to ask you a question. Yeah. Why are you glowing? Um, really? You're going to ask that? Yeah. Okay. Well, what is our show called? The Power of Jim. <laughs> the Power. Do you get it? Power of Jim. All right. Okay. All right, okay. let's That's talk a one. Patricia. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a wonderful local attorney. I've known her for years and we're actually doing business with her right now. And we're really excited because she's the best in the business and her specialty, her one of her main specialties is probate. So why don't we just jump in today's show and ask Patricia the question, because a lot of people, when I mention the word probate, mm -hmm. uh, especially because I sell real estate, and I'll tell people, okay, well, this house that we're looking at, it's a foreclosure or uh, in the, you know, it's vacant or it's, it's owned by an investor. Or I'll say it is going through probate. And then what's the first question they always say is, what's probate? So what's the better thing to do than to ask our special guest, Patricia, what is probate? Okay, Jim, thank you so much. Probate is the process of uh, someone else handling the affairs of a deceased individual. As you know, if somebody, uh, like in your case, you get a lot of clients coming to you, their parent, father or mother passed away, mm -hmm. and they think that they're going to inherit this house immediately, and the, the title's still in the parent's name. And so it has to go through probate. And I'll tell you why. Usually when you go through probate, you have a will, and that's called dying testate, or you have, you die without a will, and that's called dying intestate. And so a lot of times people do not know that just because your parent owned that house and you are a child and you're going to receive that property, it still has to go through the process because someone has to be appointed by the court, which is called either the executor, if there's a will, or the uh, administrator, if, it's, if there's no will, that person is the sole person that can handle all of the affairs of the estate, including the sale of the property. Because the individual who owns the property is deceased and they cannot sign any of the escrow papers. And, so, oh, yeah. <laughs> and they shouldn't be voting either. <laughs> no, they should not be voting. <laughs> but anyhow. Well, you know, uh, so a lot of times what happens, uh, a, a child who uh, thinks they're going to inherit the property, they'll come and they'll say, well, um, to you, they'll say, I want to sell this. And you go and you do the title search and you'll say, well, who's Mary, Mary Smith? Who is she? Yeah. And they'll say, well, that's my mother. Well, your mother's name's on title and you do not have the authority to sell this property. You're going to have to start the probate process. So what happens is that they'll seek a probate attorney, they'll ask them some questions and they'll be told the process, which if you like, I can tell you what the process entails. Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, great. <laughs> so basically um, to get the ball rolling, you have to file a petition for probate. And that's a, a four page document that you file with the court along with some other documents. If there's a will, you have to uh, lodge the original will with the court. Otherwise, you have to jump through hoops to say that either the deceased individual lost it somehow, but they still, that was, their, that was still their last will and testament, or there is the presumption by the court that if you do not have the original will, the deceased individual tur uh, tore it up prior to their death. They did not want that to be their will. So that's why it's important to know to get a, a sense of what that person, the decedent's um, state of mind was at the time. 
were they aware that they had a will? Were they aware of their the, uh, the nature of their assets, who their heirs are, their beneficiaries? So it's, all this goes into making sure that that person's last wishes are taken care of. Well, you know, um, you know, when we go through this process here, you know, just thinking about the people that don't have something in place, right? So you're saying the will, um, the will really guides what happens, right? Yes. Is that what definitely. you're saying? Okay. Yes. So here's a question that I have, and I think a lot of people may not understand it entirely. What is the difference between a will and trust? You know, because sometimes I think maybe they both do the same thing. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, a will is individual to each person. Um, you have a will, I have a will, but with a living trust, if you're a single person, you have a, a single living trust. If you're married, you have a marital trust. But going back to the will, the will is, um, in, is uh, for the individual. It goes into effect when that person passes away. It becomes a public document at the courthouse once it's lodged with the court. Then anyone, creditors or anyone else that knows the person has passed can go down to the court and look at the document. So it's a public document. It has to go through the probate process. And, and, uh, and the fees for the probate process, some people feel that they're quite high, but being a probate attorney, I would say no, they're not. <laughs> um, but uh, the fees could range anywhere between seven to 9% of the estate. And if you're selling property, the attorney gets what's called extraordinary fees. And that's based upon their hourly rate, the number of hours they put in to sell that property. So as you can see, say for instance, a, um, uh, on a $200,000 estate, the attorney fees are $7,000. That goes $7,000 for the attorney, $7,000 for the personal representative as well. So that's $14,000 right off the top before any of the estate's debts are paid. But a living trust is more of a private document because it does not go, it does not have court supervision as long as no one contests the trust. If any of the beneficiaries contest, then it is, is filed before the court and the court takes jurisdiction over it. But generally, trusts are private documents. No one in the world needs to see what you have in your trust. It can be handled quickly. The fees are less. And that's why a lot of people, but the main thing, you have to ha have real property. So a lot of people that own their own home, they'll say, well, I want to have a living trust so my family does not have to go through the process of probate. And, and a lot of times probates can take a long time. Uh, but generally, this is the thing for me, as the attorney, we don't get paid until the case closes. At the end of the case, the judge will issue an order and that's when we get our fees. So it behooves the attorney to move the case along quickly. Wow. So today with the virus, are we seeing that the, 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 these things take a lot, lot longer? Say, oh, I didn't hear your question. Well, with uh, the, the virus, uh, um, the coronavirus uh, example, say something in San Francisco, I'm going to guess something that could have taken three to five months could take a year now. Am I right? Well, so the process is um, elongated by the, the size of the county. San Francisco is a pretty large county. So having dealt with it before, we're looking at court dates maybe um, three to four months out at least. And now with the courts being closed, we don't know what this is going to look like once the courts open back up. And I have a, a, a case in Solano County in which they already said that they're not receiving people coming to file documents anymore, you have to drop them off. And so that's a trade-off as to when we're going to get our documents back. So um, I don't know what it's going to, this is going to cause a little backlog with the courts. And um, and I think they've prepared for it because at least in Solano County, we have another uh, judicial officer hearing probate matters now. We only had one before, now we have two. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, that's promising. So, but the, but the most important piece of advice that we could give our, our uh, viewers is don't die until the virus is over. Or if you're going to die, get that will going. 
uh, and they, they can come to you to prepare, correct? Uh, well, one thing I want everyone to know, because you want to do your own estate plan when you have the mental capacity to do it. You want to do it. What I'm trying to say is you want to do it when you're younger rather than as you age. Because once you are diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's or any type of illness where you're taking drugs that are going to change your way, you alter your thinking, you are bordering on not being able to have the legal capacity to execute those documents. And in instances where people are um, diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, then somebody in the family would have to be appointed their conservator by the court, another court process. And then after they are appointed the conservator, then they will go back to court and ask the court for permission to do an estate plan for this person who is either has dementia or Alzheimer's. And so basically that person doesn't have the capacity, they may not even remember who their beneficiaries and their heirs are. And so the conservator is going to have to use their best judgment to do an estate plan for this person. Maybe this person hadn't seen their child in over 25 years and they didn't want to leave them anything. Right, but they're estranged. the conservator knows that they have four kids and they want to make sure that all four of these kids get something. So that's why I always suggest, particularly when people buy real estate, that they should do an estate plan at that time Why they have the mental capacity to understand what's going on you know that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense because really real estate is probably the most um the most expensive commodity people are going to own and it's, it's pretty incredible how if you don't have things in place by the way my my, my dad also went through that and he started uh forgetting so, certain things we saw the signs and so we had to do exactly like what you said you know and I'm glad that we put certain things in place um, because I will tell you, um, I've heard about it, but now I've been going through it a little bit. Fortunately, my sister and I are, are really in sync. However, we have disagreements. And I'm glad that we had talked about these things before and now rather than later, right? Because once yes. something goes to probate, pretty much first off, you lose control. All bets are off. That's my understanding, right? Um, no, not necessarily. Like I said, well, going back to the will, the will is the controlling document. What it, once the court admits the will to probate, they have to follow all the instructions in the will. Okay. So okay. That's, that's great thing. to know. And so the other thing that people need to know that if someone dies and they don't have a will, the state of California has already determined who your heirs are. So it doesn't necessarily go to the state like people think, oh, the state will get this property. No, there are companies out there. If a person died and they didn't have a spouse and they didn't have any children and you can't find any relatives, there are companies out there called heir finders. They'll find a third cousin removed that will get that property. The last thing is going to happen is if no one comes forth, then what the, happens is the state holds the proceeds for a period. The county holds it for seven years, then they send it to the state and it's held there indefin indefinitely. That's what's called the unclaimed property. So anyone that's a, a heir that can trace themselves can collect those funds from the state. But those are rare instances because with the heir finders, they find heirs because they get a percentage of what they find that they're, and before they even tell the heir that there's a, an estate, they have them sign on a contract, which they get a percent of, and then they let them know that, oh, yes, you are a beneficiary of this estate or you're an heir of this estate. You know, I have a question that, that goes along. This actually came up in discussion. Is it true that let's say if you have young kids, right? And let's say you're, you're, you're a single parent and something happens to you, even other relatives cannot step forward if you don't have things in place that the state will actually, they'll become a ward of the state for the children if you don't have somebody already assigned? Okay, again, in your will, in your estate plan, you can designate someone to be a guardian for your children. But um, what if it's not designated is what I'm- If it's not designated, the um, Child Protective Services is obligated to find relatives for those children. 
Okay, it will be a, a little struggle for them if there's nothing written down, but they will find um, a family member. And also that family member has to be able to um, comply with the rules that they have in place before they place any children in a non-parental home. So that's why it's important again to designate, I want so-and-so to be the guardian for my children. And when you think about a guardian for your child, don't think necessarily about grandparents because they could be too old to take on that responsibility. So it should be someone that, that possibly is a married couple that also has kids similar in age, but you need to talk to these people before you designate them in your estate plan because they might not want to take on that responsibility. I had a, a case where um, this couple had adopted, they were in their 60s, but they had adopted young kids. They were preteens and they wanted to make sure that someone was going to be able to step forth and take care of those kids in the event they passed away. And it was very difficult because, you know, t taking on two kids and you have your own family, that's a lot of responsibility. So you need to talk to people and make sure everyone's on the same page. Otherwise, there could be instances where they are placed with uh, child protective services in a foster care home. Interesting. So, uh, Patricia, with the virus, uh, are you having to alter the way you do business right now? Uh, oh, yes. Um, I saw my last in-person client last week, and I met that person at the law library in Solano, Fairfield. But right now, I'm not seeing any people in person. We're going to do Zoom, <laughs> um, Zoom meetings, and we are, I'm even thinking about how am I going to be able to do, um, execute estate plans with people? Because you have to be there in person. The notary has to be there also. And so that's going to be a challenging uh, task to kind of figure out how we're going to do that. Yeah, because there are only certain designated uh, professions that are that legally can go out and do stuff right now. Are notaries on that list? Or do you know? Well, I saw a notary, a mobile notary car <laughs> driving around the other day. So I'm assuming that they are on that list. That's true. We are actually closing travel, several transactions right now with mobile notaries. So I hope to God that we're doing it legally. So. And you keep bringing up the virus and I just want people to know that we're, you know, people unfortunately are getting very sick and they're dying. And if you don't have your healthcare directives, your power of attorney for healthcare de designated right now, I mean, what if you are taken to the hospital and a family member is not with you and they don't know who to contact. So, I mean, Again, it goes back to planning early rather than later. And that's good. And, and hopefully people understand their own morality a little bit more right now because of the horrible things that are going on. Uh, yes. But they should uh, be thinking about talking to someone like yourself, Patricia. How would somebody get a hold of you? Well, uh, <laughs> um, can I hold up my business card? Absolutely. I don't know whether you'll you be able to it see up. it. <laughs> we won't hold it against you in a court of law. <laughs> okay, great. No, but anyhow, well, yeah. um, I'm on, I'm, you can find me online. Um, I'm on several, you Google my name, Patricia A. Simmons, attorney at law, and I will come up. Um, I'm on several law sites. Avo is one and Justia Law is the other. And I have my profile there. Um, it tells you, it gives you a little bio of me. Went to UC Berkeley, USF Law School, and um, 26 years in February of this year practicing law, and 23 of those years on my own. So um, the whole, I, I, I would say for people to go to Avo, A V v o dot com because it has a complete profile of me. It has reviews from my clients. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was really interesting because somebody a couple of weeks ago before we were shut down at the court, they wanted me to do a probate for their uncle's estate. And I said, I asked him, well, how did you find me? He said, well, I did my research. I checked you out all over it, all, all the different sites. I saw, <laughs> I saw your profiles. And so he was very impressed with that. And so, you know, that let me know that those sites are doing their job. Wow. 
Right. And and if somebody's lazy and they don't want to do the research or they want to <laughs> take my word for you or or Jim, they can always message either of us privately and yes or if you want i can give you my number now but i'll give it i'll give that to you and you can put it at the end i guess if you want yeah yeah actually yeah. We'll, we'll definitely uh um get ways for people to contact you as well because this is very important now here's the incredible thing is that you know when we hear about something that's really important we have it for a moment unless we take action it's proven you know 24 hours boom <laughs> you're on to something else so i encourage you if uh, some of this resonates with you when you don't have something in place, uh, make sure you uh, talk to somebody like uh, Patricia, you know, reach out to her and have her tell you certain things because it is very important. I'm going through this with my dad. I actually worked a lot with uh, seniors also in terms of planning. And mm -hmm. the whole thing is, is that um, there are some things that, uh, that you probably won't know that you don't know until you find out at that time when you don't have the power to exert what the wills are of the person that has passed away or of your family. And, you know, I know, Patricia, you've been around the block for, for a little while here, although you look really young. You've been, you, did I hear you <laughs> right? You said you've, you've been in this arena for 26 years. 26 years, yes. That means February, she's been studying since she's been February 15th, 1994. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the uh, 30, yes. you're, you're about 30 right. plus, right? Yeah. 30 plus. <laughs> but, but, you know, no, it, it, obviously you have a lot of experience. You love the profession, what you're doing, if you've been uh, doing it for so long. Um, but I did have a question. You know, we're talking about power, you know, you notice power uh -huh. here, Jim. Yeah. Power, right? <laughs> One of us right. has gotten the power today. <laughs> no. But in all sincerity, um, I had a question that I wanted to see if this was true or not. I heard that in the cases of dealing with people's finances, like making decisions and moving things, a power of attorney may or may not be strong enough. Can you clarify that? Like, for instance, you know, let's say if, uh, if, uh, if somebody has a power of attorney for their parent and they want to move around money and do certain things, a power of attorney will give them certain rights, but they need to really make sure is in place the things that handle other things such as the medical directive and stuff can you clarify the different aspects okay. of what the power of attorney covers and what it doesn't because this is very important okay that's that is a topic that i like to discuss in detail with my clients because the power of attorney for finances is a very powerful powerful document you're giving someone else the authority to handle all of your affairs. So generally the power of attorneys that I draft for people, they are able to designate what powers they want to give to this agent. You can give them everything and you can designate that it only goes into effect if they become incapacitated, but it has to be a person that you trust completely. Because once you give that person your power of attorney, and it's and you say you give them an open-ended one, they have the power, the power to go down. They can sell your house. They can go and take the all the money out of your bank account. I have seen uh, have elderly clients come to me telling me stories about how someone um, took advantage of them by having them sign a piece of paper telling them it was one thing and they didn't read it and they signed it and they actually signed away their uh, power of attorney to someone and they, they cleaned their bank account, changed the, the title of their deed. So it's a very important document. Make sure that whoever you decide to, to, um, to appoint as your agent is someone that you trust because you're, you're giving away your life with that basically. And also, another thing that people don't realize is the fact that if you have a power of attorney, if that person passes away, you can no longer use it. The power of attorney terminates when the individual that gave you those powers passes. So you'll, sometimes you'll hear about people go, taking the power of attorney after a person passed and go to the bank and try to get the money out. A lot of times, banks are, are getting more aware of those situations, and they freeze accounts so no one can take the money out. But yeah, it's so easy to um, use that in a sinister way rather than helping someone. Interesting. Yeah, 
A lot of the stuff is really important. Um, you know, there's also a word, and, and I, I appreciate having an expert on here um, because it's really important. I hope as you're listening to this, you're thinking about how does this apply to me because it's very applicable to you. But, you know, we hear the word uh, power of attorney um, and durable power of attorney. What's the difference between the two? Well, generally the, the terms are interchangeable, but a lot of times... There, the, the difference lies in whether it's a power of attorney for finances or a power of attorney for health care. Sometimes people decide that they're not going to give the same person all of those powers. They might give their health care power of attorney to one person and their financial power of attorney to another person, which kind of makes sense. Um, but again, it has to be someone that you trust and you should always let people know, not that, that you're nominating them to serve in that capacity, but you should let them know what your wishes are, you know, that because if you're not able to do, to speak for yourself, that's why you give power of attorneys to other people so they can make those decisions for you, but you want them to make the decisions that you had discussed, not what they think would be best for you. And what do you see as a result? Like, I'm, I'm sure you've heard horrendous stories. People want to kind of get it together when something, you know, has happened or is about ready to happen. I know it's a very stressful time. I've witnessed some of those. What do you see as the end result when people don't have things together? I mean, what, how, how bad will it go? Will everything eventually, you know, go to the spouse so she's actually okay, so she doesn't have to worry about it? Now, what, what sort of situations can people get? You know what I'm seeing a plan? recently is more and more second spouses. <laughs> um, the children assume that because they weren't, their mother or father that the spouse or surviving spouse shouldn't be getting anything. But according to California law, if a person dies without a will and they die with a spouse, whether it's the first spouse or the second spouse, and there's more than two children, the spouse gets one half and the two children share a half. If it's more than two children, then the spouse gets a third and the children divide two thirds of the estate. So um, there are safeguards in place when people do not have a plan, but generally you wanna make sure that the people that you love get what you want them to have. So uh, that's why it's important again to plan when you have the legal capacity to do so. So if you're watching this and you have the legal capacity and you can actually <laughs> understand what we're saying, then give Patricia a call before it's too late. Am I right? Yes. And when I say legal capacity, first of all, you have to be over the age of 18 to do any type of estate planning. You have to be of sound mind. You have to know the nature of your assets and to whom you want them to go to. So if you cannot answer all those questions, then I'm not going to be able to do an estate plan for you. But most people who watch our show are over 18. Half of them are of sound mind. And a quarter of them, they know what they want to do. So you've got quite a little audience there that, uh, that could use your services. You know, another thing that I see a lot, a child will call up for a parent. And... I understand they're calling for a parent that could be like an elderly parent, but I want to speak to the parent. I don't want the child to say, well, my mom wants me to talk to you about how to go about getting a will done or doing a living trust. Uh -huh. And because you know, that's the child is not going to be my potential client. It's the parent. It's, I need to talk to them in a confidential manner to get their desire and wishes. Because, you know, the child could be um, exerting undue influence over that parent. Right. A lot of times the parent might not even know that some, if someone's calling up to get this information for them. So it's very important as the attorney to do anyone's will. I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you face to face. Make sure that you understand what you're doing. And I have to feel comfortable when I leave that. Yes, this person understands that he needs to have he or she needs to have a live an estate plan, and they know who they want their assets to go to, and they know the nature of their assets. Otherwise, I'm not going to. Um, I probably would just say, "Well, 
you probably need to get another attorney to do this for you. Okay, so if, if when we try to get a, a uh, person qualified for a loan to buy a house, they usually have to have a collection of certain things before they talk to that lender. They got to have their, their W-2s or the 1099s. They've got to have the uh, uh, pay stubs, et cetera. So uh, what are the top three things you want the, somebody to have ready for you as far as documentation before they even pick up that phone? Okay. So if they have a previous will in place, I need to see a copy of that will or trust, particularly if they want to amend it. Um, I need to see that. I need to see the, the copies of their deeds to the property. See how they own title to the property. Some people don't understand that when I say, well, provide me a copy of your grant deed. And then what they'll do is they'll send me their deed and trust. Okay. For a variety of reasons, I need the grant deed because I need to get the legal description of the property. I also need to know how that individual owns that property and does anyone else own that property? Anyone else have any interest in that property? Those are all very important factors to determine how I'm going to draft their estate plan. For them. And if they don't have the answers to those questions, they can give me a call and usually I can get that information for them. Yes, because a realtor can probably go and pull the, the grant D for them. So at least they'll have that. But if, if they don't have a copy of their previous will or even a living trust, one thing that we did not talk about is when you have a living trust, in order for it to be valid after it's been executed, that individual needs to take it down to the recorder's office and they're going to do a trust transfer deed. They're going to transfer title of the property from their individual names into the trust name. They have to do that. If they don't do that prior to their death, sometimes there is the intent that they did not want that property to be part of their trust. And guess what's going to happen? Probate. They're going to go through probate. So it's important that once you have a trust, you go down immediately to the recorder's office and transfer the title of the property to the trust. Wow. You know, this is incredible information. And you know, I will, I will say you gave, you've given us a lot of value here and um, you know, Hey, Jim, no j lawyer jokes today. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is really, this is really awesome. Well, and you know, you Jim, you're, you're in real about. estate and stuff too. I know, I know um, I, I really want to help people understand the importance of a trust, a wills, the estate plan. Thank you for educating and just answering some questions I, I really personally had. And I know a lot of people don't know. And now they know because of your infinite wisdom here. Uh, Jim, you know, I know you've been in real estate. Uh, also, you're a very old man. So you've been in real estate forever. <laughs> no, but I, I know you're really respected there in real estate in all sincerity. And, you know, just I know I want to recommend more people just to take a look at the wills and trust, right? And I know you work with a lot of your clients, Jim. What's the best advice you can give for your people that um, that have a home and, and people that are working with you or that um, that that are are really you know that are just really um, people that you're you know you're aware of even your friends. Well, the big thing is yeah, get get the property into a trust, uh, protect yourself, uh, and and make my job easier too. Uh, <laughs> so a trust always looking for the easy way out. Yeah, exactly. uh, so I, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many, how many there are a lot of people who have trust now, which is great, but they're, uh, you know, they're clients of mine who unfortunately passed away and uh, they need, uh, then their heirs need uh, Patricia's help. And uh, it's, it's a time consuming, costly endeavor. Obviously, if you work with Patricia, you're in great hands, but before you die, go do the proper thing, talk to someone like Patricia and get things set up. Mm -hmm. One more thing before we go, I just need to, a lot of times people don't want to do a living trust because they say, well, it's too expensive. Can I just put my child on title with me? And I always say, no, that's a bad idea for you because A, your child could be involved in litigation and get a judgment against them. And what's going to happen when they do a, um, a asset search, they're going to see that he owns he or she owns property. So that's a, that's bad right there. Um, you know, a, re, a variety of reasons why you do not put your child on your deed with you. And that's why you 
instead do the living trust where the property will go to the child at the proper time upon your death. And at that time, you're not going to be here. And so it doesn't matter whether he has judgments or liens or bankruptcy, you know, against them because that property would be his at the time. But to do that right now, you know, your car, your child could be involved in a car accident. A variety of things can happen to, um, in the end result will be you losing your property because you put your child on. Well, I will tell you, I, I was just uh, 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 just giving you a little laugh there. I, I love the little dog right behind you there. Cute, cute one. Oh, my doggy. <laughs> and that's what I love. You know, you know, we have to understand, you know, Jim, I told you, lawyers are people too, okay? <laughs> so, so they have dogs and everything. But in all sincerity, um, I love the discussion today, and I hope all of you found it really helpful. Um, I want to thank definitely our guest here, Patricia. Jim, any final thoughts before we end out today? Um, I think if you're watching this uh, before you die, call Patricia Simmons, and you'll be glad you did. But what, Thank what, you. It would be helpful before they die. Yeah, but, yeah. 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 <laughs> what is after they die? What kind of advice? Uh, all right, you or then? after <laughs> the family can. Yeah, or well, we next episode we're going to be doing a seance. So anyone who has died into state, uh, they're they're asked to join Zoom uh, for our next uh, seance. We're, we're going to have a Ouija board. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> that is great. Any final words from you, Patricia? Um, no, but again, I cannot impress upon people enough that you need to really do this. Particularly, you know, Jim, when you sell someone a home, you need to ask them, well, do you have an estate plan? I mean, just for their own peace of mind. You right. know, it doesn't have to be me. It could be anyone, but they really should have those documents. You'd be surprised right. how oh, many people do not point. have anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, if you're a realtor and you just sold a home, you know, that would be a great thing to do. Just recommend that they have certain things in place the way that, that they need to have in place. And, you know, as we end out here, I want you to think about your situation here. If you want the desires to be your desires, what happens to your estate when you go, you have to have a plan in place. Otherwise, there are some random decisions that are guided by certain guidelines that may not be your wish or desire. So I will tell you, Alan Lakin said, planning is taking the future, bringing it into the present so that you can do something about it now. So we want to thank all of you for joining us here today. Take this information, contact Patricia to see what you can do to make sure you secure your family's financial future. This is Jim T. Chong, The Walk Star, along with... Jim Meyer from Remax Gold and Patricia Simmons from the law office of Patricia A. Simmons. And we're raising the bar. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>